Praise the Lord, everybody. Welcome to our sit-ups, our spiritual impact training using prayer and scripture. I am Pastor Tony Burke Brown, and you know what time it is. It's time for our spiritual nourishment. It's time for our bread of life. It's time for us to, to just uh, meditate on some word, right? On Monday through Friday, 6 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, you know we had the prayer. And then you come on here and we get this word. And you write down your notes and you go back and you meditate on them and study them more and apply the principles to your life. So spiritual impact training using prayer and scripture. This is our sit-ups, our spiritual workout, our spiritual nourishment. And so we are continuing our study in the book of Genesis. If you've been following along, if not, you can go back to my channel, find the sessions on Genesis. Each one of the chapters has been broken up into either one, two, or three parts, depending on which chapter it is. But please, if you've not been following us, Please go back, find those sessions, and go meditate on the previous chapters so you can catch up with us because right now we're in chapter 28. As we continue, don't forget to check out the information for our morning prayer if you've not yet joined us. Don't forget underneath, underneath this YouTube video, you can click subscribe and then click the bell and you will get notifications when I upload videos. So we are going straight into the Word. Get your pen, get your paper, your highlighter, and your Bible so that you can take notes so that after we're done here, you can go back and study on your own. Again, we are starting in Genesis 28, verse 1, and we are reminded that Jacob, Esau's twin, has stole Esau's blessing from their father Isaac. He tricked Isaac into thinking that he was Esau. And so Isaac accidentally blesses Jacob with the blessing that was supposed to belong to Esau. But we know Esau had given away his birthright. And so now his blessing was taken away from him. Now he's angry. He wants to kill his brother Jacob. So Rebekah their mother tells Jacob, hey, your brother wants to kill you. He's angry with you. I want you to go to my brother's house. I want you to go there until your brother calms down, right? And so she tells Isaac, Rebecca tells Isaac, hey, you know, I don't want Jacob to marry one of these, basically one of these heathen women here. So she was setting it up so she would be able to send Jacob off to go live or go stay at her brother's, at her family's house, right? So by the time we get in chapter 28, this is when Isaac then calls Jacob in and blesses him to go, to go to Rebecca's family's house, to go there and find a wife that's actually from her family. So this is what it says in Genesis 28 verse 1. Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him and said unto him, Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. Arise, go to Padanaram, to the house of Bethuel, thy mother's father, and take thee a wife from thence of the daughters of Laban, thy mother's brother. So he's telling them, go and get you a wife from your mother's family, right? Verse 3, and God Almighty bless thee and make thee fruitful and multiply thee and thou that thou mayest be a multitude of people. Now, this is continuing the blessing from Abraham. Abraham, Isaac, now Jacob. Because it goes through Abraham's line that the children of Israel, the nation of uh, Israel, the, the Jewish nation, the people of God will be birthed through that line, Abraham, his son Isaac, and Isaac's son Jacob. It should have been or could have been Esau because he was the firstborn, but he sold out his birthright and he was tricked out of his blessing. So now it's coming through Jacob. So basically Isaac is speaking that over his son Jacob. Lord Almighty, bless thee, make you fruitful, multiply you, that you may be a multitude of people. Verse 4, and give thee the blessing of Abraham to thee, and to thy seed with thee, 
that thou mayest inherit the land wherein thou art a stranger, which God gave unto Abraham. So remember, when God led Abraham to Canaan, he told him that was the land he was going to give to his descendants down the line. Now we know that the children of Israel are not yet birthed, but God has already, he had already given Abraham the plan before Isaac was born. He had already told him he would make him a great nation, that he would have many descendants, that he was unable to count them. This land was going to to be that land that was going to be given to the children of Israel after their birth, after they go through slavery, after they're delivered, God's going to bring them back here and it's going to be their promised land. But in verse 5 it says, And Isaac sent away Jacob and he went to Padanaram unto Laban, son of Bethuel the Syrian, the brother of Rebekah, Jacob and Esau's mother. When Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Padanaram to take him a wife from thence, and that as he blessed him, he gave him a charge saying, Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan, and that Jacob obeyed his father and his mother and was gone to Padanaram. And Esau, seeing that the daughters of Canaan pleased not Isaac his father, then went Esau into Ishmael, unto Ishmael and took unto the wives which he had. Mahalath, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Neboah, to be his wife. And Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. Now I'm going to stop for a minute because we didn't pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we bless your name once again, and we thank you for this word. We thank you for feeding us. Lord God, Father, the bread of life and giving us the living water, giving us understanding, increasing our faith, helping us that we can grab hold of your word, Lord God, and hide it in our heart that we might not sin against you. Father, help us, Lord God, to, re to receive this word with gladness. Lord God, help us to have ears to hear. Help us, Lord God, that we're walking in the principles that, Father, in the name of Jesus, we are standing on your word. We are built on a rock. We are moving in your truth and we are becoming the men and the women of God that you purpose us to be. So we thank you for your Holy Spirit who is our teacher. We thank you Lord God for giving us what we stand in need of. That as we receive this word Lord God Father that is manifesting in our life changing us from the inside out that we will never be the same in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. So what we see now is that Isaac sends Jacob away to the, his mother um Rebecca's family so that he can get a wife there but Esau hears this and now he sees that his father has now blessed Jacob to go and get a wife from their mother's family and not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan he sees that Jacob obeys his father and goes and so now Esau, seeing that the daughters of Canaan pleased not Isaac, his father, says, then he went unto Ishmael and took wives of Ishmael. Remember, Ishmael was Abraham's son through Hagar. He was the one that was born when Sarah sent Abraham into her handmaiden because she thought she wasn't going to be able to have the son that was promised to him. So he had Ishmael, but Ishmael, after Isaac was born, began to mock him. So Ishmael and his mother were sent away. And so Ishmael was not the promised son, but God said he would bless him anyway. But now um, Esau takes one of Ishmael's people to be his wife. Now listen to this in the NLT. We're going to go up. We're going to go to um, the New Living Translation uh, in verse 5 when it says, So Isaac sent Jacob away. He went to Padanaram to stay with his uncle Laban, his mother's brother, the son of Bethuel, the Aramean. Esau knew that his father Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him to Padanaram to find a wife and that he had warned Jacob, you must not marry a Canaanite woman. He also knew that Jacob had obeyed his parents and gone to Padanaram. It was now very clear to Esau that his father did not like the local Canaanite women. So Esau visited his uncle Ishmael's family and married one of Ishmael's daughters in addition to the wives he already had. His new wife's name was Mahalalath. Mahalath. She was the sister of Neboeth and the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son. So when we look at this, you would think that um, 
Ishmael is Isaac's half brother. We just said that, right? So this is his half brother, the son of Abraham and Hagar. And Esau had already married two foreign wives, right? So now Esau hoped his marriage to Ishmael's family was going to please his parents, Isaac and Rebekah. But this is not so. So this is what he seems to be attempting to do is, hey, I'll marry from your half-brother's family. But this is not something that is pleasing to Isaac and Rebekah. So in verse 10, what it tells us, and I'm going to continue in the New Living Translation. You always go back and study from the King James, but I'm just doing this for time's sake to kind of break this down. In verse 10, it says, Meanwhile, Jacob left Beersheba and traveled toward Haran. At sundown, he arrived at a good place to set up camp and stop there for the night. Jacob found a stone to rest his head against and lay down to sleep. As he slept, he dreamed of a stairway that reached from the earth up to heaven, and he saw the angels of God going up and down the stairway. At the top of the stairway stood the Lord, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your grandfather Abraham, and the God of your father Isaac. The ground you're lying on belongs to you. I'm giving it to you and your descendants. Your descendants will be as numerous as the dust of the earth. They will spread out in all directions, to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. And all the families of the earth will be blessed through you and your descendants. What's more, I am with you and I will protect you wherever you go. One day, I will bring you back to this land and I will not leave you until I finish giving you everything I promised you. Now look, this is the same promise that God had made to Abraham and Isaac. So it's going through the line. Abraham had Isaac. Isaac was given the same promise. Isaac had Jacob. Now Jacob is given the same promise that God is going to bless him, give him many descendants, as numerous as the dust of the earth, spread them out in all directions. Uh, all the families of the earth are going to be blessed through him. This is just what he had told Abraham when he called him at the age of 75. So God is reiterating and confirming his promise. And so now he says, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to protect you wherever you go. And one day I'm going to bring you back to this land because this land is where the promise, you know, he's coming back to this land. And so he tells them in verse 16, then Jacob wakes up from his sleep and says, surely the Lord is in this place. And I wasn't even aware of it, but he was also afraid and said, what an awesome place this is. It is none other than the house of God, the very gateway to heaven. Now, remember, I'm reading from the New Living Translation is plain English. You still want to go back and look at your King James. But verse 18 says, the next morning, Jacob got up very early. He took the stone he had rested his head against and he set it up right as a memorial pillar. Then he poured olive oil over it. He named that place Bethel, which means house of God, although it was previously called Luz. Now, this is... Um, one of the first places that Abraham had offered a sacrifice to God. So this tells us then Jacob made this vow. If God will indeed be with me and protect me on this journey, and if he will provide me with food and clothing, and if I return safely to my father's home, then the Lord will certainly be my God. And this memorial pillar I have set up will become a place for worshiping God, and I will present to God a tenth of everything he gives me. So again, we see over and over when God makes promises, he keeps confirming it. He keeps reiterating it. When you look in the word of God, you continuously see the same things over and over, the same principles, the same promises, the same principles, the same promises in the old Testament in the New Testament, the Bible does not contradict itself, but God continues to repeat himself over and over. You see in the Old Testament, when he says, I'll never leave nor forsake you. You also see that in the New Testament in Hebrews. You see over and over, God is, he is the promises that he made to the children of Israel. As we are abiding in Christ, he gives us those promises. He promises to be with us. He promises to provide for us. He calls us, you know, the word tells us in the book of Peter that we are royal priesthood, right? That's what he says of the children of Israel. He says we are peculiar people. 
You know, the Bible lets us know we've been set apart. And so, so the same things that were promised, the same things that were spoken are the same things that are still being spoken because God is immutable. He's unchanging and unchangeable. His promises are the same, but also his principles are the same. We have to be holy because he's holy. We have to walk with him. We have to abide in his truth. We have to seek his face. We have to yield to him. And so as we see him sharing the same promise with Jacob, sharing the same, you know, information, the same promise, the same blessing that he had given to his grandfather and his father. It lets Jacob know that God is with him, that God is real, that God is true. And he's saying, if God is going to be with me and protect me and provide for me on this journey, right, and return me back home safely, he is surely my God. He is certainly my God. He says, I'm setting up this memorial pillar. Right? And he says, this is going to be a place of worship to God. And I'm going to give him a tenth of everything that he gives me. And so this is him setting up to give back. When we talk about giving a tenth, when we talk about giving a portion, when we talk about giving a tithe, he's saying, this is going to be, this shall be God's house. And of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth unto you. And so this is, you know, God making promises to him and him making promises to God. This is where relationship is. It's good that God had made this promise to Abraham. It's good that God had made this promise to Isaac. But just like us, Jacob had to get a relationship with God himself. So it's good if our grandparents were saved. It's good if our mother and or father know the Lord and, you know, and told us about him. But then still we have to have a relationship with God on our own. It's not enough that we have a cousin or a sister or a brother or a mother or a grandparent that knew God or that knows God. No, we have to have relationship. God wants relationship with us. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. It's whosoever. It's individual. The word says, um, the one that is led by the Spirit of God. The, he that is led by the Spirit of God is the Son of God. You know, those that are led by the Spirit of God, those that believe and receive gain power to become sons. It tells us in John 1 and 12. And so it's an individual relationship. And so we need to remember this as we're looking at principles here, that yes, his grandfather was promised this. Yes, his father was promised this. But Jacob had to walk with God himself. He had to be in right standing with God. And so just as we don't have to follow in generational sin, if our grandparents or parents were bound up in some type of sin and some type of bondage, some type of lifestyle, or had some type of sickness or illness, we don't have to receive that because through the blood of Jesus, we are new creatures in Christ Jesus. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. We don't have to do what they did. We don't have to be who they were. We don't have to be bound if they were bound. But the same thing goes for if they were walking with God, if they knew God, if God was speaking to them and promising them things, we don't just automatically get it because we're offspring. We have to make a commitment. We have to yield to. We have to submit to God. And so that's what we want to remember in here is that God was giving him the promise and Jacob was making a vow to God. It's relationship. And this is going to take us into the next chapters because we're going to see also that once again, there are things that transpire. There are so seeds that we sow where we then um, reap what we sow. And that's what we're going to be looking at as we continue to go on because we're going to see where Jacob is building relationship with God. But then he's still yet going to get paid back, so to speak, or reap what he sowed when he stole his brother's blessing when he deceived as we go on we're going to see that he too is going to be deceived and so we have to see where things seeds are sown we have to see where we have to have our own relationship we have to we have to make our own commitment our own decision we have to decide for ourselves that no matter what we're going to follow God Jacob was a fighter that wanted what God had for him. He wanted the blessing. He wanted the birthright. He wanted to be in that promise. He fought for it through, you know, selling out, you know, selling his brother uh, a bowl of stew for his birthright, 
tricking his father for the blessing. And now he's making a vow unto God. He's doing whatever it takes for him to be able to be in this promise. But still yet, no matter what, we have to remember that whatever we sow, we reap. That reminds us of David. When David was a warrior for God, David was a fighter. David stood against Goliath. You know, David, you know, wasn't fearful. David inquired of the Lord. David was ready to go to, go to battle. He trusted God. He was a man after God's own heart. But still yet, when he sinned with Bathsheba, there was consequences on his whole household. Because even though God may forgive us, he will forgive us if we confess our sins. There's still seeds that we've sown. There's consequences for sin. And even if we, you know, strive to be in right standing with him, we always have to remember it's not enough that you go to church. It's not enough that you sing in the choir. It's not enough that you say the prayer. It's not enough even that you preach the message. It's not enough that you're a Sunday school teacher. It's not enough that you plan the program. You have to be in right standing with God. So our memory verse is actually going to be uh, in Matthew chapter 7. Because I want us to remember that this is about relationship and being obedient to God. Not our works. We're not saved by our works. Being in right standing with God makes us do good works, but we're not saved by good works. In Matthew chapter 7, um, I want you to meditate on beginning in verse 21 when Jesus said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils. And in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. So he goes on to say, you know, those that hear his word and do it are likened unto a wise man. But this is what we want to remember is that these are church people. These are people that prophesy in his name, that cast out devils, that did many wonderful works. These are people that you can see their ministries are expanding, that it seems like they're doing good work. Surely they have eternal life. Surely they're in right standing with God, but not necessarily. Because God can use whomever he wants and there can be an anointing upon someone's ministry and somebody can be doing great works and have enough faith to cast out demons and to prophesy, to stay in the word as far as reading it and knowing what it says and being great teachers and, 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 you know, and being bold in the things that they're doing, but still yet be out of the will of God. Still yet, they could be living in sin. Still yet. They could be disobeying God in some area of their life and some association, relationship, decisions they're making, something that they're doing that doesn't line up with God's word and still yet be out of the will of God. So don't be deceived and don't think because we do certain things because, you know, we've, um, you know, done some things in the church or because we taught some lesson or because we ministered to somebody that that automatically means that we're in right standing with God. We have to be obedient. We have to be submitted. We have to be committed. We have to do what is right and pleasing unto God. We have to literally walk in the word of God in our life. And so I want us to remember that we need to line up and make sure our relationship with God is right. There's promises for us. There's an inheritance for us. There's blessings before us. There's a plan that God has purpose for us. But we have to submit and commit to him so that we can receive what he has for us. We're going to close out in prayer. Don't forget, we are meditating on Genesis 28 and then on Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. Father, in the name of Jesus, we bless your name and ask, Lord God, that you continue to pour into us. Father, help us to become all that you purpose, that we're in right standing with you in relationship with you, Lord God. Father, abiding in Christ, hid with Christ in you, according to Colossians chapter 3. Help us to remember, Lord, that you're with us, that you never leave nor forsake us. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, we desire to walk upright before you. So, Father, we pray that you would help us and strengthen us and hold us up with your righteous right hand. Help us to hunger and thirst after righteousness that we may be filled. And so we commit ourselves to you, our ways to you. And, Father, ask that you would use us as vessels and instruments unto you, that we would bear fruit that will remain, that the things we say and the things that we do, the way that we live, the associations that we have, the conversations, Lord God, that we participate in, let everything that we do, Lord God, bring glory and honor and praise to your name, that we are the light, that we're the salt, and that we're representing the Savior. So we thank you, we praise, love, and honor you in Jesus' name. 
Amen. God bless you. Love you to life. I will see you on the next sit-ups.